The Lord is with you. And also with you. We continue listening to God speak to us from the gospel and the tradition of John. Glory to you, Lord. Pilate re-entered the Praetorium and summoned Jesus and said, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Do you say this of your own accord, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, Am I Jewish? It is your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, My realm is not of this world. If it belonged to this world, my followers would have fought to keep me out of the hands of the temple authorities. No, my realm is not of this world. So you are a king, said Pilate. You say that I am a king. I was born and came into the world for what purpose? To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who seeks the truth hears my voice. This is the gospel, the good news of our salvation. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. By the words of the gospel, may our sins be blotted out. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Good evening, Father. Traditionally today, or tonight, this weekend, we celebrate the feast of the Solemnity of Christ the King. And with some people, this doesn't resonate with us because we've never lived under the reign of a king. If we study American history after the Revolutionary War, the father, founding fathers of our country approached George Washington and wanted to make him king. Because that was the rule way of ruling that they understood, that they were from, and they were comfortable with. But in his wisdom, Washington said no, and then got together with other people and began to discern how should this new nation be ruled. And so with Thomas Jefferson and Washington and Adams and the rest of them, they came up with this idea of a democratic society where everybody had a vote. But the feast still resonates in places that people are comfortable with the idea of royalty. And we have to look at the readings that we've had said to us this evening. And our own church fathers in coming to understand what this meant. Obviously, they were relating it to a system of government that they were familiar with. And remember, when we talk about a king or a ruler, it wasn't one under dominance. When we talk about, say, for example, the longer reigning one like England, the idea here was, uh, if we follow the history, and if the history be true, with um, Arthur and the Round Table, you know, that everybody had a place in society. Everybody had a, a voice in that society. And the king was one who protected those rights of those individuals who were part of his kingdom. And so the idea of a king was more of a, a father, a father figure, one who protected and those individuals who were his <coughs> subjects then were more of his children. Now, we do understand that history has shown that sometimes people have become despots and individuals who uh, took over the power of individuals and, and ruled with a mighty arm. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about one who protects, one who who works with, one who is of the people, for the people, and by the people, if we could use the words of our country forefathers. But still, we, we don't understand this idea of kingship. But then again, our country is, what, 240, 250 years old? And we look at the European countries that are 1,000 years old, 100 years old, we look at a city like Paris that dates back to the times of the Romans. But we don't have that history. We don't have that longevity to say, yes, we understand what they're talking about. 
And so people in the early days of our church took this idea, and it was only formulated within the last hundred years or so that we established this Feast of Christ the King. But Christ was looked upon as the ruler of the world from the earliest days, from Paul, from the writings of the early apostles. Because our theology told us that in the end, all things will be handed over to him. All sovereignty and power and glory and all the world's riches will be handed over to the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes in his glory. And then he will turn and give everything back to his Father. And so there's a whole theology that was developed here that Jesus would come as the Almighty One, as we hear in the selection of chapter 7 of Daniel, where he says, And one in my vision, who looked like a son of man, came before the Ancient One upon the throne, and to him was given all power and glory and honor, and his reign will never end. So the early church fathers and mothers took those words and described how Jesus was the king who is to come. As we hear from the gospel, the words were said to him, Are you a king? And he says, You're the one who's saying I'm a king. And if I was a king and my rule was here, my subjects would never allow this to take place. But as it is, my reign is not of this world. Today we celebrate the reality that Jesus should be in our own minds and lives. Our be all and end all. That Jesus is the one who came to us out of love. Who came to us out of the Father's love. And as I reflected on this feast today, this afternoon, I couldn't help but think of what I had been reading. That God is on our side. <coughs> we were taught, no. God is a loving Father, but He's going to punish you. He's going to get that last judgment, and He's going to point the finger at you and say, Why did you not? I remember listening to a priest on EWTN, and I cannot imagine what theology this man must have learned. But he said he had a dream of his death and he was presented to Jesus and Jesus said you did not preach the words that you were supposed to preach all you preached about was money and because of that you're going to go to hell well thank you but you gave us this material church and without money we would I mean we wouldn't even have tents but can you imagine that you would be, because of the fact that he lived a good life, he lived a priestly life, and he preached about money. Well, he's probably told to. He probably had to. But be that as it may, God is not against us. God is for us. And the fact that Jesus came to die for our sins is even a little bit ludicrous. Because it's not something that was decided after the fall. I have to relate something to you. When I was in the hospital, people would say, well, did you have something? And I said, well, before the fall. And I thought, gee, that sounds so <laughs> biblical. Before I had fallen and hurt my knee again. Before the fall. Anyway. It had already been decided. It was decided before creation was established that God would come to be one of us. Why? Because he loved us. Loved us and loves us and will continue to love us with a love that we're not, we're not used to. As far as this concept of kingship is to the Americans, so much more further is God's love from us. We cannot understand it. We cannot understand it. So whether we can understand and appreciate this feast of Christ the King, whether we can rejoice in this solemnity as the last day of our liturgical year and look forward to the great feast of Advent coming along for the next five weeks, it doesn't matter. But what does matter is that we begin to think that God is on our side. 
God cares for us beyond all our imaginings. I read something from an Irish Dominican friar who wrote, if man and woman were to cease to exist at this moment, God would die in his grief. Let's keep that in mind. 